Okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Robert Bishara, for uh, agreeing um, to talk with me uh, today about decolonizing psychology mainly. So maybe can I ask you to say a few words about uh, yourself and introduce yourself to the students? That would be wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, hello to your students. Um, so I am an assistant professor of psychology and humanities at Northern New Mexico College. Um, I teach um, psychology courses, but also uh, courses in film and even uh, crime and justice. So I have a sort of transdisciplinary background and that really helps uh, shape my um, kind of critique of psychology. So we're discussing in um, Monday's lecture, cultural psychology, cultural aspects, and also want to discuss decolonizing psychology. And just for you to know, we read a paper by Patia and Priya and one um, by Achil Mbembe. And if I may start with my first question, and this is related to the paper, Patia and Priya are describing in their paper uh, a very specific situation that I think is very typical for psychology. They're describing that Indian software engineers are fluent in English, um, but it is their cultural communication style and cultural perceptions about time, work, productivity, and planning that are seen as deficient and problematic when it comes to like international collaborations or like working in a, a Western uh, company. And so the authors are criticizing that there's particular management techniques and psychological approaches employed uh, by those Euro-American companies to kind of create an ideal type of global culture that every company and every worker and manager must work toward in order to complete uh, to compete in the global market. And I wanted to ask you about your opinion. I think this is a very traditional way of approaching things like cross-culturally. Mm -hmm. And would you say that this kind of cross-cultural approach effectively is reflecting uh, coloniality of psychological science? Yes, absolutely. Because, um, so, I mean, you mentioned globalization and, you know, I like the idea of uh, thinking globally and thinking in a worldly manner, to use a term from Edward Said, worldliness. We can talk about the worldliness of psychology or worldling, worlding psychology. But globalization in the sense that you used it specifically uh, tends to mean uh, a monoculture where uh, basically there's an expectation for the rest of the world, meaning non-European uh, countries, to assimilate into a certain model that we can call Eurocentric or Euro-American. And of course, uh, there's some kind of linguistic uh, hegemony or even linguistic and cultural imperialism with the imposition of a certain language like English as the language, right? Um, so in my understanding, um, you know, so there are critiques of cross-cultural because it tends to be really monocultural. And so basically the other cultures are always seen from the perspective of a dominant culture. Um, and my, the approach that I take is to try to critique the dominant culture from uh, these so-called, um, you know, less dominant or less hegemonic or subaltern cultures. And so Sunil Bhatia is a great example of someone that does that. Uh, he approaches it from kind of an Indian uh, perspective. I try to, in my work, I think about um, mainstream or Euro-American psychology uh, from several perspectives. Uh, so I, I think I try to think from an indigenous perspective, particularly here in the global north, uh, given uh, the historical experience of colonization, and also try to think from a black perspective, uh, meaning citing black thinkers, black theorists, black psychologists um, who are often marginalized uh, within the discipline uh, because also of that e historical experience of uh, slavery, right? The enslavement of African bodies. And, um, and the third perspective that I use, which we can call global Southern, uh, and that's the most expensive one because it really is a reference to Latin America, 
Africa and Asia. So it's a very broad term uh, to refer instead of thinking West versus East, which is t tends to be like a cultural discourse that you know uh, operates within the framework of Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. Uh, North versus South is more of a political economic model. So um, the global North, mainly, um, you know, uh, Europe or countries that have been, um, that grew out of Europe, in other words, um, they tend to be economically dominant and politically dominant in, in kind of on a global scale. So thinking about it this way um, shows us that it's not just about some kind of simple binarism of cultural differences, which doesn't really exist because there's more complexity than that. But there's really uh, a material difference in terms of who gets to uh, actually call the shots because of their economic and political power. Um, so that, that's, that's kind of how I think about worlding psychology is to think from a non-European perspective um, and thinking about it in terms of North versus South as opposed to West versus East. Absolutely. I, I think that's interesting. We've been coming from cross-cultural psychology and then we realize like this, there might be like a more individualistic and collectivistic culture, but then we also realize this is way too simplified. Um, and, and, and then again, also like this idea of post-colonial, right? And then decolonizing psychology. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how, how do we contribute to the decolonizing mm. psychology project? I mean, we can probably yeah. easily say psychology has to be decolonized or we have to do decolonizing psychology. Do you have any ideas? Well, all of us, the scholars, teachers, professors, students, what can we do? Absolutely. So first of all, I mean, as I mentioned, is this idea that psychology is more than European. So one worlding psychology. So trying to think about psychology in a global sense, not in a globalized sense of that, the critique I had earlier, that it's a monoculture. Um, so in other words, there are psychologies, right? Um, indigenous psychologies, black psychologies, global Southern psychologies. Uh, and so when you think about it this way, then you can see the complexity and the diversity which cannot be reduced in a binary fashion. And then the other thing is to think about psychologists themselves. So as you know very well as someone that teaches this, since the birth of the discipline in the late 19th century, up till the 1970s, with few exceptions, most psychologists have been white, um, bourgeois, and also male. And most of the subjects or human participants were also the same, right? So uh, women in general were excluded, non-whites were excluded, and of course uh, the working class were excluded. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's just the fact of history. Um, not mentioning all the unethical issues with, uh, you know, some, some of the so-called classic studies that we teach in social psychology or what have you. So that means that we have to, um, you know, this has been problematized mainly since the 70s, but I think there's still much more work that needs to be done about centering non-white, female, and working class, middle class voices in psychology. So that, that's another thing you can think about. And it's so important uh, because the students who, you know, do not belong in that very small category of white, male, bourgeois, um, do not see themselves in these texts. So, I mean, you teach in Egypt. Um, and so there's this kind of cognitive dissonance to use the concept from, from, from psychology, right? So there's a, an assumption that the teachings of psychology are universal but they're really provincial. And then there's this kind of universal, universalizing tendency from the pro provincial setting. So we have to be more humble and um, you know, claim that if you're studying that specific group, then your findings apply to that group and they don't apply to every single human being in the world. And that's fine. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And it, it, it will be interesting um, to think about that. So you know, looking at, at the psychologists, but also uh, 
Um, we can talk about the difference between post-colonial and decolonial, which you mentioned those two terms and they're not necessarily the same. So post kind of implies a temporality, right? Something that's after colonialism. And it tends to specifically refer to that movement after the Second World War, where you had the decolonization of Africa and Asia. So many countries that were, for the most part, under British colonialism, including Egypt, right? Um, fought to become independent republics, right? Now, whether um, they were able to uh, decolonize themselves or not, that's a different question. But postcoloniality refers to that temporality, uh, but it doesn't necessarily refer to a project of liberation. So the decolonial project is a project of liberation. So it's an ongoing process because obviously we're not there yet. There's still oppression, there's still suffering in the world. And um, the decolonial project is about centering, especially the voices of those who are oppressed and those who suffer the most and trying to understand psychology from that perspective. Thanks for mentioning that. We are yeah, actually realizing a lot in uh, our discussions when we discuss those one of those westernized concepts that they don't necessarily apply to communities in Upper Egypt, communities elsewhere, um, but also within our communities. So um, sometimes we ask ourselves, what are those good old European, Euro-American psychological theories good for, right? So why do we learn them, uh, like those traditional psychological concepts? Or uh, maybe ask differently, how should one teach an intro to psychology course today or in the future? That's a great question. The way I argue, I mean, I, I don't know, you talked about uh, assigning part of my book, A Critical Introduction to Psychology. And in there, I talk about uh, how that course should be called really Introduction to uh, European Psychology. It's never called that. So the implication of calling it introduction to psychology is that we're talking about something that's a universal science. So now, this of course, is thick psychology, right? Uh, big mm. P, big P, capital mm. P psychology. And of course, as you very well know, as someone from Austria, that psychology has its roots in Germany specifically. So there's like Germanic tradition. Uh, uh, and, and so it comes from, it comes out of a specific context. Uh, it's, it's a specific location it didn't come out of out of italy it didn't come out of france right and it also comes out in the late 19th century to distinguish itself from philosophy and to try to align itself with especially the natural sciences like physics biology and chemistry so there's kind of a a complicated relationship with philosophy there that we also have to talk about right um and this whole complex of trying to identify with the natural sciences, but never being seen as equally important or equally scientific or equally objective. So that's kind of like the struggle of psychologists for the longest time. And they're always trying to prove themselves through the methods and saying, well, we're following the scientific method and we're doing experiments and all of that. And as you know very well from, from the history of the discipline, most of the time that doesn't work. Uh, some of the most famous uh, studies like Milgram or Zimbardo are also some of the most unethical studies because we're dealing with human participants and we're not just dealing with objects, you know, we're not dealing with chemical compounds or inanimate nature. We're dealing, you know, psychologists are humans who are studying humans and uh, they're trying to isolate those humans from their social context and trying to understand them and it doesn't work, right? And oftentimes it, it can be very damaging. So to go back to your question, uh, I think there's something uh, that comes out of the German tradition. Actually, there's kind of a bifurcation because you have the natural scientific approach, uh, which you know uh, tends to be credited to Willem Wundt because of the founding of the first experimental lab. But of course, his project of uh, folk psychology gets ignored, which is different from the kind of experimental approach. Another thing, of course, is within the German tradition, we have also the human scientific approach of Deltai and Brentano, which is an approach that tends to be marginalized. So you have these two approaches coming out at the same time. So of course, Franz Bernan Brentano was uh, Edmund Husserl's teacher, as well as Sigmund Freud's teacher. 
So that's fascinating. And you have phenomenology and psychoanalysis with their roots and this kind of human scientific approach. And, you know, um, these are two influential uh, approaches to this day uh, within what we can call critical psychology or human science psychology, right? So they're there, they're, they're still, uh, they're still relevant, but they're obviously uh, not included in, you know, the mainstream natural scientific approach. So there's that tension. I would say that the thing that I would add is that this human scientific approach is worth saving because I think it's a better approach to studying human subjectivity than the natural scientific one. Uh, the only thing I would problematize about it is that we have to kind of enter into dialogue with it in terms of who is human. And this is the question of oppression, basically, that is central to my work. And so, of course, as you know, given the history of colonialism, um, the colonization of lands, the exploitation of people, the enslavement of people, um, the, those people that were enslaved were not considered human, right? So when we talk about human science, uh, are, are those people who, you know, between quotes, non-European or maybe uncivilized, right? Because it's always from that perspective, are they considered human? And if we go back in time, probably a lot of the amazing human scientists were also probably racist. That's, that's kind of the contradiction we would have to resolve. It's like, yes, we need to save the human scientific approach, but also bring in this question of oppression and you know who was historically framed as subhuman or non-human. Uh, because ultimately that's the central question for psychology, right? The human. And so we can just study that abstractly without looking at the historical experience of those who were not considered human. And this struggle obviously continues today. We might not have the slavery of the 17th century, but we have human trafficking today, which is also a form of slavery. And so we have to look at all those issues and they have to be central in terms of how we think about psychology. Otherwise, we're just doing abstract work uh, that doesn't have any concrete relevance in terms of, you know, resolving human suffering in the world. Absolutely. That um, I'm happy that you're mentioning some of those like real big global challenges, because I think when we look at what traditional psychology has been investigating, the question is really what future topics should psychology look into, right? So, so what's kind of like the the, the research um, interested in, we're, we're in the middle of a crisis, but we are also in the middle of many crises um, that are ongoing. So yeah, human trafficking, I think is, is um, a very great and very relevant example for that. Absolutely. Um, you've mentioned um, those um, racist tendencies in psychology, I think they're all over the place, right? So when we look at the beginning of brain science or like the study of the brain or intelligence, for example, right? We can find a lot of uh, really problematic um, ideas and approaches there. And I think you also, what you've mentioned is also um, targeting the idea of that this research and scholarship is done within institutions, right? So there are structures and there is institutional racism, institutional oppression. So um, we read this article by Achel Mbembe about decolonizing the university new directions. And he's listing some ideas and like developing them further um, of decolonization in the university. Do you have any ideas? So how do we make universities and education more accessible and contribute more to knowledge equity as professors, as scholars, as administrators? Yeah, my idea is very radical, so it will be controversial. But the only way it can be done if, if the schools are free completely. Um, and so that model does exist in Europe, actually. I know, I mean, you can tell me about the Austrian case, but I know in uh, probably in Austria and Germany, many Scandinavian countries, even France, um, you pretty much almost have free universities, right? We do. The problem still is that um, there is a large selective bias, even though there are free. 
um, kids with an educational background, with an academic background, um, are more likely to get as access into the university and are more successful within university. Right. So yeah, we can look into those specific issues, but I think one, uh, you know, the 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 education has to be free and accessible to all. That's I think it can't be just a, a privilege for some. So for example, I teach a, in a college that's situated on indigenous land uh, in northern New Mexico, and that serves, uh, or you know, it's specifically focused on serving underserved students of who are mainly Hispanic and Native American. So that college means a lot for those students. And it's very affordable. It's not free, but it's almost free, right? So um, we do everything we can to make sure that the students are able to attend. So I think this is the first barrier is the economic one, really. If you can go over that one, then you have the kind of ideological one which I think you kind of pointed to is like, okay, it's free, but you can still have these ideologies that are oppressive. And, and this, is, um, this is the work of uh, educators, honestly, uh, is to bring in those critical perspectives and challenge uh, the more mainstream uh, approaches. And, um, and so being critical of something is actually more work because that means you have to know the thing itself that you're critiquing and developing an approach for critiquing that thing. So you're actually doing extra work. Um, and of course, that's why it's avoided by a lot of people because it's easier to just study the thing itself and not have to think critically about it. But this question of criticality is very important. Uh, another thing that's for my work that's important is the question of transdisciplinarity. So one of the things I appreciate about my department is that it's not a psychology department. I actually work in a humanities and social sciences department, which means that um, there's psychology, that we, we teach psychology, we teach crime and justice, we teach humanities. Um, and so we have different things that we teach. And of course, we uh, come from different disciplines. And so we have to sit together in a meeting and talk and I think that's good to avoid this question of monoculture that we talked about in the beginning. Um, how do you avoid it? Uh, trans, transdisciplinarity is how you do it. And so another thing that's important, in, especially in terms of psychology, because of its uh, historical roots in philosophy, is to always think about psychology in relation to philosophy, uh, theory, and history. So those, those are like three important tools. If you just think psychology, natural scientific attitude and trying to align it with chemistry, biology, uh, and physics, it doesn't work because we have a strong historical tradition uh, that goes back to philosophy. It's just that philosophers didn't think about it as mind. They, saw, they thought about psyche, but for them, psyche was soul or spirit or breath of life. Um, it, this understanding of psyche as mind is a very recent one. And so we shouldn't shy away from uh, perhaps other understandings of psyche uh, that could actually align very much with indigenous approaches or even uh, black or global southern approaches, right? So this question of the soul or the spirit, I know psychologists will look down upon that as non-scientific, but it's still relevant for a lot of people. So why should we shy away from this question when uh, it, it matters, especially in a context like Egypt, which I'm sure a lot of people, that question uh, of spirituality is, is still an important one so absolutely and i think like in an applied field this is i think very much reflected in community psychology right like we go work in a community and then we first of all work with ideas and concepts that are there and not that we bring from the books maybe as a last question sometimes you you a little bit mentioned that sometimes it's quite exhausting to criticize all those concepts and then also it's also sometimes frustrating to realize this doesn't really work this is flawed those experiments are flawed it's not only about the replication crisis the idea of the mm -hmm. experiment might not be uh the best one what makes you still like what what still gives you agency as a critical psychologist with all the criticizing what makes you still like being able to work with something and to look for new mm. approaches well i think uh, i reject this uh, 
you know, it's it's all how how we understand the discipline itself. So if you understand the 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 development of the discipline as just a, a question of progress, so that basically every new perspective negates the one before it and it's the better one. So you go from psychoanalysis to behaviorism, you know, to the cognitive one, to neuroscience. And so neuroscience is the best one and that's the one we should adopt, right? Um, I don't ascribe to that because as you well know, yeah, we the, the technologies that we have today in terms of fMRIs um, and all the kind of technologies for scanning the body or the brain didn't exist in the 19th century or early 20th century, but that thinking about that kind of neuroscientific th thinking existed though. So it's not a new thing, right? Um, even Freud himself, you know, the founder of psychoanalysis was trained as a neurologist, right? Um, so the thing that appeals to me is kind of, again, uh, thinking philosophically, thinking theoretically, thinking historically, and uh, looking at the discipline's um, interesting um, achievements that are seen from today's perspective, perspective as things of the past. So for example, psychoanalysis as the first kind of, one of the first dominant approaches. It's not the first one because obviously there's, you know, functionalism and structuralism before that, but they, you know, psychoanalysis became this major force within psychology early in the 20th century. And then now uh, it's seen from a mainstream perspective as outdated or something like that. Even though, uh, curiously, if you look at the cognitive psychologists, they use a lot of ideas from psychoanalysis, but they don't like to credit Freud or the other psychoanalysts. So they talk about the cognitive un unconscious and things like that, right? Well, where did you come up with that? So we have to kind of do um, a genealogy of ideas. Uh, so a lot of concepts we use today come from psychoanalysis. A lot of major psycho, uh, psychologists were trained as psychoanalysts. If you look at ma many of the, um, the social psychologists, Eric Erickson, um, you look at um, uh, Muscovici, you look at many, many of them were trained, I think even Piaget himself. Uh, so I, many I, of them- I was about to say developmental yeah. psychologists, absolutely. Right. So the, the influence of psychoanalysis is there. Uh, the language itself is there. Um, but we, we don't actually take it seriously. So I, I'm someone that takes psychoanalysis seriously. That doesn't mean, of course, that psychoanalysis doesn't have issues because, you know, if you know anything about my work, it involves a critique of psychoanalysis. But uh, the kind of critique that I believe in is critiquing from a place of love. So I love psychoanalysis, but I think it has problems. And so my critique ultimately is uh, has the aim of improving psychoanalysis. Uh, and so that, that's that's kind of one of my main projects. That sounds great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Robert. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And thanks so much for all the great answers and like giving, giving us some thoughts to reflect and discuss in class. Yeah, uh, thanks welcome. for doing that and have a wonderful day. Thanks. thanks.